Well, hey there, everybody. We're here at Sea Lee Kanegi Park. This is where we have our fall picnic at the shelter. It's off the 79th Street entrance. And this is where Kids Day will be happening June 13th. That's a Thursday, June 13th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. In fact, that'll happen over here on this green space. It'll happen in the parking lot as well. But over here on the green space by the blue bench, this is where we've been invited as a church to lay out the lawn games for all the kids to play, for us to interact with people. And so we have those games already in our South Vestibule. I have two committed volunteers to help already, but we need more help. We probably need four or five people here minimum to lay out games in this green space area as we see fit. There's a sign-up sheet at the foyer welcome wall. Kids Day at Kanagi, Thursday the 13th from, we well, gotta set up the games here probably 9 30 for us to 1 p.m. Okay, God bless. Hey, good morning everyone. So if you heard the video there, we are having Kids Day at Kanegi this Thursday the 13th. So that's officially from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Now we want to get there a little early. In fact, we want to come here. There's a little group of us coming here to grab some of the lawn games that you may notice are in our cornhole and giant checkers, kids can play on the lawn and that kind of thing. So we have a small group of people rolling those out for us. We're also hopefully working with some area churches on that as well. So if you are free this Thursday, we could use your help. You could be here at the church at 930 to help load some of those games up. We're not taking absolutely everything with us. We're just taking the, the best games, right? The big ones. We're putting them in the back of the car and we're driving over there. So it's not too late to sign up and help do me a favor. If you sign up and you know Dan and Laura Baguna, give them a shout out. We're looking at them as our primary volunteers. Um, so your help would be much appreciated um, if you're able to join for that. Hey, another announcement today. This coming week, not Thursday, but Wednesday. On Wednesday, our midweek Bible study is canceled. And our midweek praise team practice is also canceled this week. So just know that. And for the last announcement, hey, I'd like to call all of you to know 
young adults aged 18 to 30. You know, it's so sad when I'm not in that age bracket anymore. Young adults, young adults, but also it's for the young in heart, the young in heart. So if you want to come uh, support our young people for a, a young adult gathering, it's going to be Sunday, June 23rd. That'll be 5 p.m. at David in Virginia. You can bring a lawn chair, you can bring a bag of chips, and just bring yourself food, games, fun, and more. Um, it's an outdoor, it's a relaunch. My last announcement, of course, we do have our fish fry today. I'm so thankful for the people behind the scenes setting it up. A little bit of bad news. Our care list at the end of the hall is out of order. And so that's a pain. I got to tell you, we, we, we pulled out all the stops to get that fish. We had people here Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. It just, it just could not be fixed in time. If we need to make accommodations for you, I don't know what that looks like, but we're going to make it happen so that you can experience the magic. With all that being said, let's let's just go to God in prayer. Father God, we just we thank you for who you are. Lord. We thank you that no matter what's going on around us, God, that you are in control. You are sovereign. That you do it from love. God, that you are, your your word says you are love, and we know that's true and eternal love for us. And that's that, that's how you flow into us through the Holy Spirit, God. And you called us here through the mighty working of your Spirit. You're still drawing people to your Son Jesus Christ. But we thank you for that, Lord. May this be a, a house of worship, a house of joy, uh, not from human strength and human endeavor, but God, because you, you're at work right now, creating something beautiful in the gospel. Thank you, Lord. Be with us in worship today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And God, Amen. Thank you this morning, John, for I invite you to stand this morning as we sing our next song, Battle Belong. Thank you. 
What a joy it is when you're able to preach and also to play the drums and play guitar and just fellowship with all of you. Hey, what a joy that really is. And, uh, Al, you had it right. We're going to go ahead and call it up for the rest of this time. And that's very sweet. It's time of giving. And uh, the plates are going to be right up here for you. And as I am now coming forward, thank you guys. Appreciate you so much. Won't y'all join me for a word of prayer? Thank you, Father, that you have given us all these opportunities to praise you, to glorify your name. We just thank you so much, Lord, for the ways that you have richly blessed us. And just impress upon us today, Lord, impress upon us you are still at work, that you are still doing miracles. You are doing supernatural things even right now in our midst. People are encountering you, experiencing you, God. So wake us up a little bit, God, to see that you are mighty to save and you are saving right now and you're enriching our lives right now through the power of your Holy Spirit. So God, bless the giver. Bless the giver this morning. May we understand that when we give to you, Lord, we give to you and you multiply what we give. You take a good measure, press down and shake it together. We thank you, Lord. We thank you how you multiply what we give to you. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. join me for a prayer over here at the drum. Father God, we just come before you, and we thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you for the piano. We thank you for our extra singers today, for the sound booth and sound people, for everybody working hard in 
preparing the fish fry and setting the table setting and frying those pork chops. We understand that it's not just a party, but Lord, that you have called us to gather as your people for edification, for worship of your name, for getting encouraged and inspired because you are always on the move. God, we praise you. We bring you the glory of anything we're working at. May we work at it with all our hearts as if we're working for Jesus and not for people. So God, we just praise you this morning. May you dwell in the praises of your people. God, may you bless this service. May you bless the people who give so much so much behind the scenes. May they know, God, that you are with them. You are with them and you are for them. So we thank you and we ask and pray in the mighty powerful name that you bring us a spirit of joy. God, that you bring us a spirit of joy today because the world is against us. And yet you have told us, you have shown us, we know in our heart, you have told us the world. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to praise your name. In your name we pray. And all of God's people. Hey, everybody, I just want to tell you that we had an awesome first Sunday fun day experience last week. We had a lot of kiddos come out. Some came a little late. Even as I saw them coming in, I pointed them out. We had so many people behind the scenes setting up for the fun day, advertising. You know, we had a team of people who even did canvassing for this thing and advertising on the sign out front. Hey, listen, I know we didn't see the whole entire neighborhood come out, but I also know They go and tell their parents, it's just so awesome. And I want to let you know, we had some pictures of them. A couple of those pictures went out in the church we made, but I really wanted to have something up on screen for you. We need official picture pictures. So if you're down there, everybody's got a phone, snapping those pictures. And by the way, they have to send me the pictures. They have to send me the pictures or put them in a Google Doc. We can share them. And then we really have to own this thing, that everybody's doing this, that we're all a part of it, and that this is something we can do. You know, that we've been encouraged and inspired, and, and we have this in our hands because God has made the way. You know, the fully funded ministry is just going to grow from here. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for all your support on that. We're looking forward to another one July 7th, you know, that first Sunday of each month. Okay. So um, going through all that, I hope we have a picture slide there for you, by the way, a fun day next time. In and through all the fun day stuff. A question I was asking up here, maybe you were down there and you didn't get to see it, is what's the point? You know, what is the point? Because we do all these things and we hear all these good messages, you know, but then we face trial after trial and here and now, and it's like, oh gosh, Lord, I'm following you, but man, maybe I don't want to. And this is not fun. But what if the point is, what if the point is, through all of through knowing the living God. You know, we can know Him today. Something supernatural happens to us. You know, it's not from this world. It completely changes us from the inside out. So that everything is totally different. You know, that is the point. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I mean, does this describe you? It's not just talking about pie in the sky after you die. You have life to the full today in Jesus Christ. So what I'd like to do is pick up where we left off Sunday, last Sunday, in 2 Corinthians. We're going to pick up in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. For those of you who missed last week, we're going to have some callbacks. We're going to be moving in unison together aware of the secret and the message we as a people are thinking of. This is what the Bible says. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving, and God will receive more and more glory. Verse 
verse 16, chapter 4. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Though our present troubles are small and they won't last very long, they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them all and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now soon be gone. The things we cannot see last forever. The word of the Lord. Father God, focus our gaze on things we understand, on the reality right in front of our face, but the spiritual depth behind the curtain. May we be a people of love and grace and holiness to where we're serving the need and people spreading the gospel right in front of us because we're not focused on the surface level of the around us, but on the deeper truth behind it all, the heavenly truth that you have called us, that you have saved us, have sanctified us, and you're going to raise again because you have blessed us all. Father God, remind us of that through the working of your Spirit. Getting into what's the point? What is the point? Last Sunday we asked the question, what about the early believers, the early disciples? Why did they continue on? Well, they faced a lot of persecution and adversity. Why? So why did they keep doing it? They kept preaching and teaching. They loved people with the love of Jesus Christ. They forgave one another. They were fighting for the gospel when the whole world was against them. Why do we do it? The Bible says we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had. And he said, well, I love this God. I believe God. So I spoke. Boy, how, how's that for a reason? I believe God. So I spoke. I followed him. I believe God called me, Pastor Mike. That's why I speak. In fact, Jesus has called all of us to speak and to never give up. First big takeaway, Jesus didn't just send Peter or Paul, you know, or the pastors and all that and the missionaries of today. First big takeaway, Jesus calls all of us and he says, go and make disciples. Share about him. Don't need a special call, so to say. And again, I'll keep coming back to this. What is the point? What is the point? Well, it's interesting when you take that question, what's the point, and you bring it to Scripture. And that's what we should do. We have a question, bring it to Scripture. We're wondering about something in our lives. Why would this happen? Go to God's Word. Take a look at Acts, chapter 4, the early disciples. Here's, here's what they say. They say, as for us, we cannot help it. We cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. Acts chapter 4. It was like the psalm says, you know, I believe God, so I spoke. We just can't help speaking about this awesome God. We just can't help ourselves. I mean, this is pretty simple, actually. Something so different, so unique, supernatural has happened to me, I just can't help but declare about it. Well, funny thing about simple things is that um, as time goes by, it's easy for us to forget about the little things, the simple things, basic things, things we all, maybe we know at first, it's very powerful, but as time goes on, it's funny how 
funny how we forget how faith can sometimes become this, you know, this pain in the lip service sometimes. You know, or trying to save face, or I'm just going to go through through the motions. Maybe maybe some of us are doing that to make mom and dad proud, make them happy. You know, they went to church, so I'm going to church. Maybe some of you are still doing that long after mom and dad have graduated to heaven. You know, but following Jesus does something different to us. The Holy Spirit of God transforms us into to be people, a different people, people who simply cannot help but care about Jesus, who he is, and what he's done. Say it is right there. It's the, it's the truth. If people can pay lip service to God, if Jesus said, "You know, not everyone will say to me, Lord, Lord, who's going to enter the kingdom of heaven," what is the proof of true faith and true belief? I, I think the question really boils down to the individual in your heart. Has Jesus really transformed your heart? Has He moved you to want to be like Him? To serve? become holy and get close to God or not? Well, we believers, his church, we ought to be like the woman at the well. John chapter 4, Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at the well. What's a Samaritan? That's a foreigner. That's an outsider who has every reason not to believe. My people... Jesus saved her. I'd like to show on the screen what happened next. This is what the woman is talking about. What happened next is many Samaritans, Samaritans from the village, believed in Jesus because the woman said, He told me everything I ever did. You know, I often revisit this scripture because we see somebody who has been transformed by Jesus and they just can't help speaking about what they've seen and heard. And I gotta say, you know, personality. Um, Jesus is not asking us to be an extrovert. <laughs> you know, Jesus is not calling you to be a different personality type. Whether I'm an introvert, extrovert, doesn't matter. Actually, the Bible talks about this. The, the Bible says, doesn't matter what is important. Galatians five six. What is important is God, is faith, expressing itself. Love. That's what's important. It might look different for you. But is your faith expressing itself through love? Are you caring about Jesus? Because you can't help it. And um, I know that some of you have heard this by now a couple times. I, I've shared a little bit about this before, but there is power in our testimony because we can share from our heart what God has done in us and through us. And so, I, you know, I'm just going to share with you um, what, what God has done for me. I'll share a little bit of my own testimony for you. It's not about me. It's about what God has done. So, um, in my late teenage years, you know, thousands of years ago, I became um, what I would call a troubled young man. And um, a lot of different reasons there, but I was becoming more and more aware of the world around me, right? Of, of all the evils that this world has to offer. Things like war, you know, violence, suffering. And I couldn't find a good answer as to why the world is the way it is. And, you know, I got lost. And I got so caught up in all the dark and depressing details of this world. And it's bad. We're not sugarcoating that one at church. I got lost. You know, I, I, I began to think, what's the point of it all? Because as I see these different churches and scientists and they're saying this and that, you know, everybody's just disagreeing. And so if everybody's disagreeing and the world is just becoming a worse place, I began to get depressed. You know, I mean, really down. And uh, I, I remember thinking when I graduated high school that, uh, you know, I don't want to go to college. You know, my parents, you know, my peers, like my pastors, and I felt like they all had these high expectations for me and they wanted me to go to college. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to. Start a, go to trade school, start a career, and 
nothing like that because we all get depressed. I, I felt like one of them. Why, what's the point? Why do anything? And people just want to keep killing each other and lying and cheating and stealing. You know, innocent people keep getting bombed all around the world and people are starving. And, you know, why would a good God let all this happen anyway? back, I see the grace of God in this, but um, I ended up going to Mid-America, Nazarene, and um, I think largely because of peer pressure. You know, I, at the time I felt like, wow, I just don't want to go through all the, all, all the feelings of, uh, I don't know, people being disappointed in me. So I went to college. Yeah, in hindsight, I see the grace of God. And so what am I doing there? Well, I'm still in a bad place, but I'm knocking out my gen eds. You know, I'm not super committed because I'm, I'm depressed, you know, and I'm getting help and all that. But still, it's not easy. Because all the while, I just knew. I mean, I just knew there had to be more to this life than all this suffering. And so what, what I start doing? Well, I start researching. Well, I start researching everything I could. I got online. I was looking at these free-to-watch documentaries and documentary about this and that and all the wars in the world. I'm just, I was just trying to learn why is everything so messed up. And I was watching this documentary about Laos and Cambodia when the United States bombed the Ho Chi Minh City in the Vietnam War and how the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot, the dictator, they, they took over Cambodia and they just ruthless evil perpetuated against the people. And just, you know, they have this thing called the killing field. It's just this total desperate evil in that situation. And um, I understood that these kind of things happen many times in many places all around the world. I just had enough. You know, this, this is enough. This is just too much. And um, sitting there in my room, my screen, and uh, you know, some, something just happened to me. You know, um, from a place of despair, felt a supernatural peace kind of begin to wash over me. And I heard this voice. I heard a voice speak out loud. It sounded like a, a soft, you know, a male voice, a very gentle, calming voice that said, Be patient. Just be there. Be patient. I began to understand that um, this broken world we live in, this is something that no human but Christ, who's Lord and God, will make everything right in the end. And there's no evil that's too evil for his love and goodness and justice to touch the right. And it just it totally changed in that moment. And I, I went to bed, and when I, when I woke up the next morning, after the next experience, after that experience, it just felt, I just felt like a new person. Something had just changed inside of me. Something had changed me to the core of my being. In fact, I, I describe this as my call to full-time ministry. I describe this as my entire sanctification experience because, you know, I was already a believer. I was saved at a young age, but clearly I was still struggling. I needed what we call around here a second work of grace. And boom, once it happened, it was totally different for me. You know, I, I saw that all life was precious to God. I understood that God would restore it all. That God would right every injustice. You know, I want to come to our passage. And our passage says in verse 14, We know God who raised the Lord Jesus. That we know that God. They really know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself with you. So they were confident in their hearts that what innocent people suffered, God will make it right. Maybe not today, but he will because he raised Jesus from the dead. He defeated even death. Even death would be reversed and set right. What did I do after that experience? After my freshman year in the summer, I changed my major in Mid-America and I, I felt this call to full-time ministry. It was very strange. It just, I knew I had to do it. It's hard to explain. And you know what? My life has never been the same since. And God totally transformed me. 
He saved me. He saved me from hopelessness. He saved me from despair. Now, I don't know what you see when you see me. You can see somebody who's got it all figured out. You see a strong person. It's not true. It's not me. I'm a person who, who, who has, has been distraught and suffered. That God totally saved. I, I think this is the story of a lot of young people these days. Because the world is pretty messed up. And we know it better. Of course, there's been sin in between. That's normal. That's what we're talking about. So, what's the point? Jesus talked about it like this. He said, Pick up your cross and follow me. He said, We're, we're, we're going to suffer if we follow him. But it's like our pastor said, You've got to catch this. And the passion is critical. There's a reason we never give up. Our bodies are dying, but our spirits are being renewed every day. There is a supernatural light at work within my bones, in the core of my being, in my heart. It doesn't come from me. Every day, my spirit feels renewed. That's the truth. Now, I, like you, have these mornings where I don't want to get up out of bed. Come on, now. God could give you one kid, two kids. God might give you 17 kids. You've got every reason to wake up happy in the morning, but you still don't want to get up. I've been there. But my spirit is renewed every day by the life of Jesus Christ. Essentially, we're saying in God's word, in prayer, in the spiritual habits and practices. Because you know what? Next pass, next, next verse. Our present troubles are small. They won't last very long. They produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them. Before you read this passage and you think, oh, he's talking about heaven, you have to understand something. When God has completely transformed your heart and you are following him and you are suffering, you have to feel this glory being produced in you presently. He is presently producing a glory that outweighs all the suffering in the present moment. That is how we are renewed. This is not all about going to heaven after we die. There's something so true in the world. The powers that shouldn't be, the demonic, try to blind us from. You know, this supernatural renewal that you can have in Jesus Christ right now, no matter what doubts you're having, it is available to you. Everybody else makes you not want to believe it. All the messaging of the whole entire world is trying to blind you from the fact that Jesus Christ can totally transform you to the core, fill you with the supernatural joy and hope that nothing in this world can ultimately take away. There's things like self-help. You know, there's new age stuff. There's meditation. And some people think the answer is knowledge. I'm just going to go into higher and higher education. I'm going to go out into the wilderness. I'm going to find myself. None of that stuff is going to help you. It might help you in the moment, but not, not long term. The reason it helps a lot of us is because God designed the world and the world to get out in nature and feel better. God designed us to do that. Give God the glory. In Christ, in whom we find all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's only in Christ. So, there's another facet in our passage about this glory that vastly outweighs suffering. Every single injustice ever, I mean ever, perpetual, Jesus will correct it. This is the second major takeaway of the seminar. Jesus will write every Injustice. This is a mind-boggling joke, but it's not bigger than God. All the evil, all the murder, the torture, killing fields, death itself, the final enemy. Father God will put it all under Jesus Christ's feet. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our truth. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the power in the gospel that even now. Murdered souls whose lives are cut short by the sinful intentions of others. Hey, we receive new bodies, resurrecting bodies like Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. So 
what the passage says. So we don't look at the troubles. We can see now. We fix our gaze. It's a very important phrase. We fix our gaze. In other words, we focus on the spiritual things. Now, this doesn't mean we turn a blind eye to evil. Far from it. This passage, and many like it, call us to turn a heavenly eye, a spiritual sight, towards the suffering and the evil. You know, an eternal perspective to these things. And God's Word instructs us then on how to act then. Because I have to think about it. What do you think Jesus thought about the world and all these evils during his earthly ministry? You know, I like to think about that. But maybe in this situation, that situation, what was Jesus thinking? You know, what did Jesus do when he saw the crowds of people, all the crowds, and they're hurting and they're suffering? A direct quote, Matthew 14, 14. Jesus had compassion on them. Jesus had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. You know, Jesus didn't just tell them, you know, things are going to be great after he died. Just grit, be true to this life, and get through it. Things are going to be great one day. No. I mean, yeah, there's truth in our eternal provision in our reward. He saw them. He saw the sun. He healed them. He had compassion on them. It's our job. It's our job as Christians, as his church, to do the same thing. I want to be Christ-like. What does Christ do? He looked at the crowd. He saw their need. He had compassion. He healed their sick and he preached his gospel. This is our, our rubric for what we should do. And so as I looked into this, I wanted to get some stats. I wanted to see how we're doing. It's important for us to know, to exegete our culture. So I'd like to share with you some research about America today. I'll share it with you on the screen here in a moment. So the first one is that around 63% of Americans currently self-identify as Christian, although this number continues to decline. And here's the thing um, about this stats. You know, stats are funny sometimes. Polls are funny sometimes. If you're trying to understand how much of America identifies as Christian, what is the understanding of what it means to be a Christian? And might that differ from person to person? So, other surveys pick up on this a little bit, and they ask the question a little bit differently. They just use different words. Do you follow Jesus actively as his disciple? You see, they're trying to get at something a little bit deeper. And when people were asked, are you a disciple of Jesus, this may shock you, this number dropped to a very low 4% of Americans identify as self-identified as active Jesus followers. I'm going to have to deceive you. you got 64% saying, I'm a Christian, but then you have only 4% saying they're followers of Jesus. They're active disciples. What's the difference? Okay, well, this is uh, said with all respect, but have you ever heard the phrase or the difference between a Catholic and a practicing Catholic? Have you ever heard that term? Well, maybe we ought to talk about a Protestant versus a practicing Protestant. Christian, practicing Christian. And the problem is, when you get into that kind of distinction, uh, it's just not biblical. This distinction just is, it just does not exist in the Bible. You know, Jesus never said, well, you know, you can be a practicing disciple, or, you know, or you can be a disciple. It's just something totally alien to the scripture. Um, it's a false dichotomy. There is no such thing. Either we follow Jesus or we don't. Jesus himself, I mean, he taught this over and over and over again. In fact, I'll just keep reading the Bible. Why does this false dichotomy exist? Many reasons. I think there's one big reason, though. I think the message of the world has infiltrated how we think about the world. I think the powers that shouldn't be are trying to blind us with these false doctrines of individualism. You know, of, uh, of uh, follow your heart, um, follow your own way, however you see fit. You know, you ever seen a Disney movie? These are very powerful messages, and they saturate our culture, and 
people who came up with us, they don't have your best interest in mind. They might even be nefarious. And they probably don't know the Lord. And we just like consume it, consume it, consume it. We get it all on our phones and on our TVs all the day, 24-7. Well, it's no wonder we're so confused about the gospel and what Jesus really said. And these, these things we don't think are shaping us. The truth is, they are shaping us. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you think is going to happen when we're constantly bombarded with a false message? It's going to begin to creep in a little bit. Maybe around the edges, but it's going to influence us. Ours, demonic and human, I think, are very confused about this. They want to distract us from the truth of the gospel. Why? They want us to become lukewarm in our faith so that we ourselves are like making a shipwreck of our own faith and giving up. Boy, if I was the enemy, I think that'd be a good way to destroy a younger generation in the future of the country. Whether or not we are truly following Jesus has always been, will always be the number one most pressing issue. I don't care what else is happening in the entire world. All the news media is trying to tell you this issue is most important, most important, most important. The most important issue is are we following Jesus Christ? we're following Jesus Christ, he's changed the core of my being. That influences all my other actions. That's why it's the most important. It's very simple. I believe God. Oh, so. A few more stats for us. A few more stats on screen for you. Every year, more than a million American millennials walk away from the church in America. Millennials. People currently in their late 20s to their early 40s walk away from the church. I was a little curious, so I looked up this study. The same survey was also done in 26 other countries in the West, in Europe, Australia, and found similar findings across the board. Same study also found that of the millennials that grew up in the church, only about 10% now self-identified as Christian. Now, I'm not sure which self-identified that one is. I have disciples there. But either way, 10% is a serious problem. One last fact. One last fact. I thought we would be interested to know. I was curious. What about us Nazarenes? People called Nazarenes. Research from our Global Ministry Center shows that 55% of Nazarene churches across the United States here in our county, we will see, are at or near the bottom of a 20-year row in attendance. And um, this is bad news, but it's not just Nazarene bad news. It's a fairly accurate representation of many mainland politics. begin to ask, like, what's the point? All of these things, all of these reasons, this is the point. You know, like, um, this is why we touch on and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. As each day goes on, goes by, and it gets worse out there, all the more all the more reason that we're doing what we're doing, that we're called to do what we do. You know, when you see stats like this, you can just have three ways. You can just let it get you down in the dump, or you can just stick at the way Jesus and then you can find his stuff. And our supernatural hope is an overcome even the worst season. What are we, what are we supposed to do? we got to love each other well. We can't stop at just loving each other well. That should be a priority for us. But we also have to be involved in our neighborhood. We have to be out there. We have to be relevant in our community. How could Nazarene disappear off the face of the earth? Would the neighborhood notice? We must always be striving to revamp, repaint, revive, revive spiritually from the inside out, also our physical premises. We can't ever stop. It has to be continuous. Why? Because of all these evil things, and it's just getting worse out there. We must never stop improving our witness, not out of compulsion, 
eyes on, I gotta go to church, you know, go through these motions. No, because Jesus has transformed us in our core to want to follow him. We want to know him more. We want to love him deeper. We want to be him in the world, Christ-like. We want to be holy. And Jesus said, this way of being isn't easy. He said, this is a narrow way, and few find it. And it's not narrow. It's not narrow for no reason. It's not narrow because you can't drink, smoke, suck. Wow, what a stupid way. It is a narrow way because few find it. It's a way of being, of living, of being changed from the inside out to love Christ. Everything else is just down the hall. The last takeaway for me. We must be seeking for Jesus to change our inmost being. What sustains us is a very core. Nothing else really matters. If, if, if we're apathetic in the faith, I mean, we're just hurting the cause. Right? Um, there's a saying, atheism, atheism has slain its thousands, but apathy, apathy has slain its tens of thousands. We can't be lukewarm. You know, we, we need inner change for outer change to happen. And only Christ can change us in this way. So here's what we have to say to this group. Let's do it, right? Let's say yes to Jesus. Say yes to all the good and holiness and love that God has for an entire world. Let's say yes and love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, the Bible talks about seek him with all your heart. That's when you'll find him. He will find you. He's been chasing after you. And even though we face trials and it's tough and you don't want to get out of bed in the morning, he knows what it is. We'll be renewed, renewed by his living hope, the living, living promise in our heart that he is going to set everything right. This is our high and desperately needed calling. We, we can't grow apathetic. You know, we have to care. We have to really care. We have to keep learning the truth. You know, evil powers don't want you to know the gospel. They don't want you to know who's really Lord. We have to keep fighting this good fight. We have to run the race as if to win. Can I get an amen from somebody this morning? We serve an awesome God, and nothing is too hard for him. He's going to overcome Christ has already overcome and he's given us his spirit today to be renewed in the battle. The battle belongs to him. That's why we sing it. God is going to make a way. He's going to do it through a costly means. He's going to change us from the inside out. It's going to be beautiful. He's got great things in store. Won't you pray with me? Let's pray. Father God, we just come before you today. We come before you here in this service, Lord. I know that there may be some hungry bellies thinking about the fish fry. There may be somebody who's in a lot of pain in here this morning, God. Bring us back to you. Center our, our, our gaze. Fix our eyes on you, Jesus. Bring us to you. May, may we realize that we are just have been blessed. We've been blessed so abundantly. We have everything we've ever needed. We've got a roof over our head. God, we have cars. We can go to the other side of this nation really quick if we want to. God, you have blessed us. Mightily, what, what are we doing, God? When we give, give to you, give in the ways that it matters. God, when you transform us inside out so we see these things, so these worries about all, all the things in the whole entire world are not so distracting to us that we don't fix our eyes on you and what really matters, the most important issue, the gospel, that you're mighty to save that in each and every person's heart, that if we're saved, if we're sanctified, if the Holy Spirit is working and speaking through us, it changes everything else. It, 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 it totally changes all my different my behaviors and my attitudes, my actions, what I'm going to do, how I'm going to respond. God, we know we're not perfect. We know we're not suddenly angels overnight. God, we need your grace. That's why we ask and pray to know you more. That we want to know you more. We want to fix our eyes on you. So do that for us. Be aware of all these blessings. God. Help draw our mind back to you all the time in the quiet moments. In the moments when we're home from work and we're tired. In our moments when the kids are going crazy. God, draw our mind back to you. Center our, may we have the mind of Christ. That we are just coming back to you in all things. Someone upsets us. What would Jesus do? If something hurts us, what would Jesus do? God, bring us into a place where we have a joy that 
destroyed all the church between now and then. We're all not bubbling up like a flame to eternal life. So you just can't help tell everybody. How do you know your mind is saved and your power for the beast? So we ask and pray in this season, in this place, for this summer, God, that you would do a mighty thing to your people. We call Pastor and Matthew in Jesus' awesome saving name we pray. Because it was yesterday, I was praying for a miracle, scared to have a little hope, and now looking back today, seeing all the things you've done, I can't even add them up, one, two, three, up to infinity, I'd run out before I could thank you for everything. God, I'm still counting my blessings. All that you've done in my life. The more that I look in the details, the more of your goodness I find. Father, on this side of heaven, I know that I'll run out of time, but I will keep counting my blessings, knowing I can't count that high. And I know the season never lasts forever, but God, I will remember all the reasons my heart has been grateful. All the times you've been faithful to me. God, I'm still counting my blessings. All that you've done in my life. The more that I look in the details, the more of your goodness I'll find. Father, on this side of heaven, I know that I'll run out of time, but I will keep counting my blessings, knowing I can't count that high. Oh, I can't count that blessed by the Lord today? Who's been blessed by the Lord today? Amen. I'm glad to hear it. Amen. He is the God of so many blessings. It's like you can't even imagine all the blessing that He has for you. And, and what will happen is the enemy will try to distract you from all the blessing. Everything He's provided, I know. I know for a fact. Everybody in this room, He has provided for you again and again and again. And He's going to keep providing for you. Amen. He is the God who provides. He is Jehovah Jireh, and we are going to praise His name forever.
like to ask us just to stand at this time. Let's just stand as you're able. If we're going to rise for a closing statement, I want to send you down. I want to send you downstairs into the fellowship hall. You might already smell the glory of the Lord. It's a fish fry. That's local talk. That's good stuff. We really hope to see you down there. Thank you for making today a priority for you. You're not here for no reason. God has drawn you here. He's drawing people to his son Jesus. He has a plan for you. He's making disciples today. He wants you to share about him. He wants to bring you up out of the miry clay like we saw last time. We just hope the supernatural ones, nobody, nothing can take away. So who are the benediction? Father God, we thank you, God. Thank you for, for making us holy through Jesus, for sending your spirit to live inside of us, God, to receive all of our lives today as an offering to you. May we be living sacrifices, completely transformed and renewed because our minds have been totally sanctified by you, God. We pray this in the mighty Christ, the name of Jesus, our pioneer and protector of our faith. For from his heart and name we pray. Amen. Amen. And before we go, we're going to sing our doxology, and I sure hope that uh, we see you all by the church. God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him our creatures here below, praise Him above you heavenly host, praise Father, Son, God, unto you counting my blessings, all that you've done in my life. The more that I look in the details, the more of your goodness I'll find. Father, on this side of heaven, I know that I will run out of time, but I will keep counting my blessings, knowing I can count the hearts.